Coming up next on Arizona Horizon. A huge acquisition for Mesa. Apple will locate a new manufacturing plant in the East Valley. And a local computer expert talks about problems with the healthcare website. And a chat with author Jared Diamond of Guns, Germs, and Steel fame about his latest book. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Richard Rellison for Ted Simons. Apple has picked Mesa as the site of its newest manufacturing plant. The facility will create 700 quality jobs in its first year of operation and 1,300 construction jobs. Arizona State University W.P. Carey School of Business professor Arnie Maltz is here to discuss the impact of the new plant. Thanks for joining us this evening. My pleasure. So what will this plant build? What will this plant create? This plant is designed to actually grow more than anything else crystals, sapphire crystal that Apple will use for the covering of their buttons, the new fingerprint buttons, and for the covering of the, the camera, basically on the iPhone 5. So growing, I'm imagining a, a clean room with... Oh yeah, all of those kinds of things, which is one of the reasons this is a terrific fit, because of course the original use for that plant was going to be something similar. So I mean, what, what form, I mean, sapphire crystals that actually evolve and morph and become something solid? My, my guess is, and I don't know all, of the, all about that, is that it's going to be basically slabs, and they will cut them to and, make proper shapes. And they will use them to make the fingerprint sensor, not the, right. not the glass screen no, over the not, phone. No, apparently not the gra glass screen, but the sensor and the camera cover. Okay. What kind of jobs are these? How, how important are these jobs? Are these sort of the high-tech, high-education quality jobs? There would be jobs? fairly high-tech. I mean, I would call them comparable to what Intel does in their, uh, in their fabs. Very similar, in, in my guess would be like, like that. Uh, what kind of training would someone need to, to get a job in this fab plant? They're going to need to be pretty, at least technically, how do I say it, technically comfortable because they're going to be working primarily with controlling and things like that. This is not hands-on manufacturing. This is going to be, you know, one step away kinds of manufacturing that we're looking at here. So someone who's had, uh, would you need a college degree, an engineering degree? I don't think you'd necessarily need a college or an engineering degree, although that remains to be seen. I think what you would need is a good technical background, possibly a community college kind of thing. And as I say, very comfortable around technology. Right, and then there's going to be supervisory roles. Oh, of course. Who... I mean, all the rest of that comes in through there. Now, Apple is buying what was a vacant building, essentially, that used to that was Correct. supposed to create create solar panels. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess t talk us through what the, the handoff is. What is Apple doing with the building and the building of these, and what is the company expected to do okay. in return? What Apple has done, and it's very common with the large high-tech guys, is to buy, because they have the money, a building. Okay, I think they spent $115 million is, is the number I, I've heard. They are then going to lease that building to AG Advanced Technologies. AG Advanced Technologies, historically, and they've been around since about 94, has built equipment to do the sapphire manufacturing, and then they have handed it off to somebody else to actually do the manufacturing. So this is a brand new situation for AG. What AG is not, excuse me, is now going to become is a manufacturer of these So things. before they, before AG would create the equipment right. that would produce these crystals, mm -hmm. produce, grow and this And they would crystal. hand that off to contract manufacturing people, to any variety of people. Now what they're going to do is actually run it themselves. They're going to run that plant. They're going to hire the people. So they're going to supervise the people. Presumably with the equipment that they've created. Yes, with their own equipment. So they have a building. They will stock it with equipment right, and then exactly. bring in employees and figure out how to run this. Is there a big learning curve? Do you anticipate any problems with them transitioning to well, manufacturing? Well, there may be. And one of the nice things about for AG is that Apple has basically handed them nearly $600 million to get them through the learning curve. So um, it's a it's a slight calculated gamble on Apple's part, but... And, well, I presume, and we don't know, since I haven't talked to Apple directly, and sometimes they don't tell you anyway, <laughs> is that um, Apple is very interested in the technology. My guess is that they are very interested in, in staying with this technology. They have not made um, buy guarantees. 
with AG. But what they have done is tell AG that in return for this, we expect you to have a certain amount of capacity at all times. Oh, so there's a chance that if this doesn't go well for this company, that, that Apple, which has bought this plant, might not take what they're selling. It might not, but again, Apple has put in the 500, it's like Apple is prepaid, right. and what they're doing is going to take this out in trade, is what it amounts to. There was a lot of secrecy around Apple. this deal with governments having to sign confidentiality mm -hmm. agreements. Mm -hmm. Is that A, normal, B, a good way of doing business to have governments be secret about business deals? Well, it's like certainly this? normal. Apple doesn't operate any other way, is what it amounts to. I mean, that's maybe a little unfair. I haven't checked all of their deals in the last 20 years, but Apple has a reputation for being careful. Normal for in. Apple or normal for high-tech companies? I guess I'm not sure about that. I mean, I think Intel may be a little more transparent, but I don't think anybody wants their elbow joggled while they're trying to negotiate incentives because incentives are sensitive to everybody. Right, So, and I guess Apple is still and I guess you can discuss whether it merits this reputation, when Apple's come into town, people seem to of change course. their normal course of business. Is that, is that warranted? How big a deal is it that Mesa gets an Apple-related facility? It's a big deal, mostly because Apple is likely to, to um, attract other things just by reputation. I mean, and also, let's, this is an advanced technology company. I mean, these guys are operating state-of-the-art stuff. So if they like it here, mm -hmm. if, if this, factory works well, do, do we think they're still on the hunt to try to move more of their operations into the United States? That's hard to tell. They have already moved um, very high-end, manufa not manufacturing, but very high-end product into the valley, into the Silicon Valley, because they are making the, the computer they're now selling for $3,000. They're making some of that in the U.S. Right. It's hard to tell. My guess is, and I've said this before to other people, is that these, what's coming out of this plant may not go to U.S. manufacturing. It may go to Mexico, where Apple has a major lead manufacturer down there. Foxconn is, is over near El Paso. Or it may go back to Asia. And I guess if, if, it, if more of it goes to Mexico for the actual manufacturing of it, the fact that we're here and if they've already established some sort of base, that might be good news going down Very the much road. good news. No question about it. Excellent. I appreciate you joining us and trying to make some sense of what uh, this deal means for the state. Appreciate you coming down. Thank you very much. You. Appreciate it. Expand your horizon with the Arizona Horizon website. To get there, go to azpbs.org. Click on the Arizona Horizon tab at the top of the screen. Once there, you can access many features. Watch interviews by clicking on the video button. You can also find out what's on Arizona Horizon for the coming week. If you would like an RSS feed, a podcast, or want to buy a video, that's all on the website too. Want to learn about specific topics like immigration or the legislature? You can visit our special web sections. Show your support for Arizona Horizon at azpbs.org slash Arizona Horizon. The website to enroll for insurance under the Affordable Care Act has been plagued with problems since its rollout. Ken Colburn of the Data Doctors is here to talk about issues with this website. Thanks for joining us. You bet. Have they called you at all? No, no, no. no, no the no, White House hasn't. I'm really low on that uh, tax surge list. <laughs> Did you foresee any of this, or, or what are the problems that one could imagine asking you know, millions and millions of people to fill out an online form? What, what, what would you be looking for? Well, if only it was that easy. And, and in fact, I don't think we have enough time to cover all of the mistakes and all of the things that, that, that occurred, um, because this is the most ambitious technology project the government's ever taken on. 
Um, I don't even think if you brought Google and Amazon and all the really the smartest people in the room, if you had brought those people in from the beginning, I, I still think there are some major challenges because of the underlying issues uh, with the old systems that they're trying to tap into. Well, because I mean, as opposed to say starting your Amazon account where maybe if someone clicks the wrong button, they get a pair of headphones they didn't want. This needs some pretty serious identity verification. Like it taps into some pretty heavy duty databases on the other end. Co correct, and therein lies the problem. Not only are they big heavy duty databases, they're really old. IRS databases and Social Security Administration. It has to tap into all of these different databases simultaneously and then come back and then give you you know, some information about your qualifications, and it's a very, very complicated process. I mean, this is an amazing thing that they're trying to do. So it uh, needs to be, this high-tech website built with today's technology needs to be able to be, in essence, technologically dumbed down to be able to speak to some of these UNIVAC computers that host so, our IRS data. Yeah, so the website that we're all looking at isn't the problem. It's what happens behind the scenes, all the stuff that we don't see, and but it, it all ends up in this little tiny form, this little, this little file format, which is all tech goobly gobbly gook. But this little text file gets sent to the insurance company as as you're you're now enrolled in their system, and that's another problem that they're having is that there's a high error rate right now on this file that gets sent to the insurance companies, which could result in people not getting properly uh, listed, uh, not properly covered. You might have to fight with the insurance company saying, I'm covered, no you're not. And, and, and so that's a major concern right now is that at the end of all of this, you know, they, they've kind of started to clear the pipes and they're getting people through, but if the data that's generated when you enroll is inaccurate, and when we say alarming numbers, if it's five, six, 10%, that's, those are huge numbers when you talk about seven million people trying to, t trying to register. Right, and, and I guess it's one thing to have the government talk to its own computers, but you're talking now about are they requiring the insurance companies to have a sort of uniform platform? Well, it, it gets really technical, and I, you know, I got to be careful about how technically I get with this. But this 834 transaction standard is kind mm -hmm. of a loose standard that they're not required to comply with until sometime into 2014. It's this really crazy mess. So right now, because the, the volume is so low, they're able to manually go through and, and rectify these these bad data submissions before they put them into their actual insurance database. But I mean, this is such, some insurance experts are saying it's going to probably take the insurance industry a year to get this thing all fixed to where it's all automated and working properly. So there's, you know, there's a lot of complexity here. Could this have been foreseen and remedied or was this something that we needed to sort of get it out there so we could see what the glitches and problems were? And that's generally not how it works. Uh, okay. There's a saying in the tech industry that you can't have nine women have a baby in a month. And that's essentially what's going on here is that people that don't understand technology have set parameters and guidelines for we will have this at this time, very it, a la I mean, Steve Jobs. Right? I, I know politics isn't your forte, but this became a political thing. This needs to be rolled out on this date, and we really don't want to move it back. So once the date was set, it might not have been the technologically perfect date. There's no way that this was done from a technological standpoint. <laughs> and that's the only way I can look at this. I'm not a politician. I'm not interested in that part of the battle. What I'm looking at is the technology and this very aggressive thing that they're trying to do and the way they went about doing it. It's like, have you ever built a, a, a 200 story building? No, well let's go ahead and have you be the general contractor. And that's kind of what happened here. This really elaborate technology project was being led by people that really had no business doing that. So given more time, this could have been remedied. It did not have to be it took, beta tested. It took Amazon 10 years to get to the point where we can just kind of click and go around and, and make these purchases, and that was with one contractor. There are 55 contractors on this that all have a little piece of the puzzle. They're all saying, hey, I did my part. And when you start to put the pieces together, they don't quite fit. You got security issues. I mean, there's just issue after issue after issue. So there's a lot of work to be done to be able to get this thing going by uh, November 1. Yeah, we're manufacturing Perhaps. the car as it's rolling, I yeah, guess. It, yeah, absolutely. It's worse. It's We're flying the plane and trying to fix it. <laughs> Ken Colburn, thanks for joining us, shedding some light on this. Always illuminating. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the 8 Insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. Pulitzer Prize winning author Jared Diamond, author of Guns, Germs, and Steel, is out with a new book, The World Until Yesterday. 
what we can learn from traditional societies. I spoke with Diamond about his new book earlier this evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. A pleasure. Let's get right into the, the heart of the book. It, it seems like you concentrated, I mean, there's so much to the, the cultures you uh, looked at and spent so much time in, but it looks like you keyed in on some very key factors that, that we can pick up some cues from in our lives, uh, starting with children, how, how the, the people of, of uh, New Guinea treat children or raise children. The book is about traditional societies, small ones, including those of New Guinea, which have to solve universal problems like raising children. And watching my New Guinea friends raise their children influenced what my wife and I did with our own children. For example, Americans tend to micromanage their kids. We left our kids as much freedom as possible, and they learned early on to make their choices. With the result, of, at age three, one of my sons declared that he was interested in snakes, and within a short time, he had 147 <laughs> pet snakes and frogs and lizards in our house. So when you started this research, you had not had children yet, or had you just begun having? I went to New Guinea for the first time in 1964, long before I had children. Our kids were born in 19. Did you find yourself, as, as you saw them, uh, raising their children in that hands-off way, almost instinctively rushing towards kids, or uh, did you fight the Western instinct, or the weird instinct, as we'll get to calling it, uh, of wanting to step in and save them from themselves, or what you would think would be themselves? I didn't fight the inst instinct because in 1964, I was unmarried and I had no intention of having children. <laughs> <laughs> the instinct wasn't there yet. That's right. Uh, and it seems like nutrition, and we, we've sort mm -hmm. of heard this, this thought of how diet has changed our lives here in Western society. What, what, do you, what did you see d during your times in, in New Guinea and other tribal regions? That's a big thing from which I've learned. When I went out to New Guinea in 1964, every New Guinean that I saw was like a muscle man. Nobody was overweight, and nobody at all in New Guinea got non-communicable diseases, no diabetes, no heart disease, no stroke, no hypertension. And, and in 1964 in America, those things were not as big, as prevalent as they are now. That's right. It's gotten worse, but they were already there in 1964. And now the reality is that you and I and most of our listeners are going to die of these non-communicable diseases, but it's within our control. If one adopts a New Guinea lifestyle, and if you eat less, if you don't get fat, if you exercise re readily, if you throw the salt shaker out of the kitchen, if you have lots of fruit and vegetables, you too can avoid heart disease and stroke and diabetes. Well, and it's adopting the lifestyle, but only in some aspects. I mean, your book, does right. it, does, your book does not flinch at mentioning some of the, I guess, more violent or things that we would not want to adopt in, in these lifestyles. You're right. Another piece of the lifestyle of one tribe in New Guinea is that when a man dies, his widow is strangled, but at her own request. Namely, the, the widow calls out for her brothers to come strangle her while she sits in a chair. I can, I, I can assure you that if I predecease my wife, I hope that my wife does not call upon her brothers to strangle. So, but this illustrates an important point, namely that there are wonderful and there are terrible things about traditional societies. And it's things that are, that's not done out of a uh, adherence to a certain religion. It's done out of what you saw as a need. We have so much available resources, uh, so this is the decision we've decided collectively to make. That's a very interesting point. In this case, some of the things that they do out of need, such as, for example, infanticide of weak babies, the reality is that they have no choice. But in this case, strangling widows. Of the thousand tribes in New Guinea, there are only two that strangle widows. And there's no reason we can see in the environment. This is just a custom like the French eat frogs and snails and the Germans don't. It's not because it's good to eat frogs and snails in France. This is simply a custom. So d did the idea of empathy, for the lack of a better word, that we're going to help the weak child, does that, is that based on what our culture has as far as a surplus or a, an abundance of, of goods and, and assistance available? Or is it a, an, an, evo an evolution, an, an evolving in our thought process? It's that we have the 
capability of keeping weak children alive. Um, we have medical care and we have food to keep them alive, whereas in, in New Guinea without obstetricians, without doctors, if a, if a baby, a weak baby is born, it's just not going to be possible for the parents to raise it. And it's not that they're, they're impervious to it. My New Guinea friends, I remember one of my New Guinea friends who lost one of his twin sons, and this really may hit me because I have twins, 14 years later when he talked about it, he was still upset. He, was, he said, it, it still gets me that, that one of my twins died after two weeks. So it's not that they're impervious to it, it's that they have no other, other choice. Right. And I guess when you look, the, the book is largely bi autobiographical in a way that mm -hmm. you're talking about how this study affected you, not academically, or I mean, mm -hmm. there's a little bit of academia, there's a lot of academia of how it affect of how it affects our life, but it really touches on how it affected you as a person. Like you were made a better man from spending time in this culture. My enemies would say that I became a worse man, but <laughs> it, is, it is true that being in New Guinea has affected me. And one of my two reasons for writing the book, one reason is that traditional people are just so fascinating. And the other thing is that many of the things that they do are useful in our lives. So the readers of my book also can learn about ways to raise their children and ways to treat old people and the value of learning multiple languages and thinking clearly about danger. And I guess you, you mentioned your enemies and there have been critics who, who talk about the book painting too broad a brush. And I guess if you're you know, condensing thousands of years of civilization into a, a digestible book, there is going to be some broad brush strokes. But again, it did seem like you concentrated on or some aspects of how it truly affected your life. Yeah. Raising your children, diet, we hope how you get treated as you advance at age. I mean, but this is deeply personal. Was it difficult to go from an academic standpoint to opening yourself up a bit? No, it wasn't because this is, a, this is my sixth book for the public and when I set out, my intention was to write an autobiographical account of my experiences in New Guinea. But my editor said, um, Jared, the, the, your readers expect big books about the world from you. They don't want a little autobiography. And so the book morphed into an account of traditional societies around the world, but illustrated by my observations in New Guinea. Are these, uh, is some of these aspects, and, and you talk about how our society, and I guess let's talk about weird society. What is the acronym for weird state? Weird, for? Western, educated, industrial, rich, democratic. All the societies that you and I are used to, societies with state governments, um, Israel, Argentina, they're weird, meaning they're Western, educated, industrial, rich, democratic, but they're also weird by world standards. That's to say the industrial societies that we're used to are very unusual by the standards of human history and by the standards of the small societies that filled the whole world until recently. Right, until yesterday, essentially. Yeah. Uh, is that, is, are the feelings that exist in the tribal societies still within us, or have we stomped them down with smartphones and televisions and all of our distractions? Interesting question. The, the, feelings, the feelings are still with us. So my, my first revelation, self-revelation in New Guinea was realizing that these seemingly exotic people who were using stone tools um, until shortly after I came out there, they're people who laugh and cry and get angry and they're scared under the same circumstances that I am. So emotionally they're similar to us, but they do different things, and in some cases there are reasons in their surroundings, and in other cases it's a matter of culture. But basically there are thousands of different experiments in how to run a human society, and we can learn from them. And I guess with our society, the experiment that we're still undergoing now, how would we decide to readopt some of our old habits to put down our smartphone? Do we need to experience another culture? Again, is it within us, or do we just need to hear that maybe life would be better if we put down the salt shaker and the cell phone? A shorter answer is we can learn by reading my book. <laughs> but, <laughs> but briefly, we can learn by adopting some of these things ourselves, and other things require changes in all society. For example, there's a lot of salt in supermarket food. 
I can't do anything about that. My wife and I threw the salt shaker out of our kitchen, but to change the amount of salt in supermarket food, that requires government working with food manufacturers. And it's happened in Finland and other countries, but it illustrates that to learn from traditional societies, partly we can do it ourselves, and partly it requires change in whole society. Jared Diamond, thank you for so much for joining us. Tonight, a signing at the Tempe Center for the Arts at 7 o'clock. Uh, if you're watching us live at 5.30, you can still make it. Appreciate you joining us. A pleasure. We want to hear from you. Submit your questions, comments, and concerns via email at arizonahorizon at asu.edu. Wednesday on Arizona Horizon, a recap of the Phoenix City Council elections and Congressman David Schweikert. That's tomorrow at 5.30 and 10 on Arizona Horizon. That's all for this edition. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a good evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.